Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about human rights and government policy. Welcome back, everyone. And we're, we're going to start off um, with, uh, with, a, with a few statements that um, the... WHO and uh, Dr. Tedros and his team um, have made a statement um, this week about we are approaching 2 million deaths from COVID-19 um, and they're hopeful that the safe and safe vaccine, vaccines will, will be rolled out soon around the world. Uh, there are s- still some some issues with, uh, with COVAX and ensuring that um, smaller countries, uh, countries that have, uh, have smaller amounts of income will be able to afford to get the vaccine so that their populations can be vaccinated and that we do see a systematic rollout of the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Um, There have been some questions because of the UK variant. Is the vaccine going to be safe? And we'll hear throughout the show that um, what the answer to to that actually is with the UK variant. Um, And there are some some other things that, that are going on that maybe um, our politicians should think closely about ensuring the fact that all of the decisions, the lockdowns, uh, the opening of businesses or the closing of businesses or schools should be done in the most of scientific manner. That they are ensuring that they are only listening to the science and not just acting on political views. So, uh, let's uh, move ahead and first we're going to we're going to listen to uh, Dr. Tedros as his opening statement to uh, the uh, press conference that was done in Geneva on Monday. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. One year ago, the first death from COVID-19 was reported and WHO issued its first tranche of technical guidance. The comprehensive package included guidance on surveillance, lab testing, infection prevention and control, a readiness checklist, and risk communication and community engagement. A year on, there have been almost 2 million deaths from the COVID-19 virus And while we're hopeful about the safe and effective vaccines that are being rolled out, we want to see this sped up and vaccines allocated equitably in the coming weeks. Next week, at the WHO Executive Board, I will be encouraging all countries to fulfill their pledges to COVAX. I call for a collective commitment so that within the next 100 days, vaccination for health workers and those at high risk in all countries are underway. Governments, manufacturers, civil society, religious and community leaders must come together to create the greatest mass mobilization in history for equitable vaccination. WHO continues to ask vaccine manufacturers from around the world to move swiftly to provide the necessary data that will allow us to consider them for emergency use listings. I'm pleased that a WHO team is in China currently working with producers of the Sinovac and Sinopharm vaccines to assess compliance with international quality manufacturing practice ahead of potential emergency use listing by WHO. To clarify this is separate from the WHO origins mission. 
We also look forward to Serum Institute of India submitting full data sets for rapid assessment so WHO can determine whether we can recommend their AstraZeneca vaccine for international use. These are just a couple of examples of work underway by WHO, Gavi, CEPI, and other partners aimed at safe, rapid, equitable, and wise allocation of vaccines. As I have said before, and will say again, saving lives, livelihoods, and economies depends on a global agreement to avoid vaccine nationalism. Over the weekend, WHO was notified by Japan about a new variant of the virus. The more the virus spreads, the higher the chance of new changes to the virus. Most notably, transmissibility of some variants of the virus appears to be increasing. This can drive a surge of cases and hospitalizations, which is highly problematic for health workers and hospitals already close to breaking point. This is especially true where public health and social measures have already broken down. This can have a knock-on effect on other essential health services. At present, the variants do not seem to show increased severity of disease. With new treatments coming down the pipeline, we're hopeful that more lives of those with serious cases of COVID-19 can be saved. But we need to follow the public health basics now more than ever. Keep as much physical distance as you can from other people. Keep rooms well ventilated. Wear a mask. Keep your hands clean and cough away from others into your elbow. You might get fed up of hearing it, but the virus is not fed up with us. Limiting transmission limits the chance of dangerous new variants from developing. What's most critical is that we sequence the virus effectively so we know how it's changing and how to respond. For example, while diagnostics and vaccines still seem to be effective against the current virus, we may need to tweak them in the future. Last week, WHO released a comprehensive implementation guide and risk monitoring framework to help countries set up high-impact sequencing programs. We call on all countries to increase the sequencing of the virus to supplement ongoing surveillance, monitoring, and testing efforts, and to share that data internationally. This helps us better understand when variants of concern are identified. We are aware that sequencing requires specialized equipment, a trained workforce, and close collaboration between experts. Building upon our existing lab networks, WHO is working with countries to enhance sequencing capacity, and we extend our support to all countries who need it. We achieve much of this through our international network of labs for SARS-CoV-2 and influenza flu lab network, both of which have been a beacon of science, solutions, and solidarity in the last year. Tomorrow, WHO's R&D Blueprint Group is convening scientists from around the world to set global research priorities for the year ahead, including on virus variants and sequencing. This builds on a year's worth of work defining and delivering on an R&D roadmap for COVID-19. Just as we look forward on research and rolling out vaccines, we continue work on the origins. We're pleased that in an international team of scientists, distinguished experts from 10 institutions and countries are commencing their travel to China to engage in 
and review scientific research with their Chinese counterparts on the origins of the virus. I want to thank all GORN partners and the countries supporting this mission. This includes Australia, Denmark, Germany, Kenya, Japan, Netherlands, Qatar, Russia, Sudan, the United Kingdom, the United States of America, and Vietnam, and our colleagues from China. Studies will begin in Wuhan to identify the potential source of infection of the early cases. Scientific evidence will drive hypotheses, which will then be the basis for further long-term studies. This is important not just for COVID-19, but for the future of global health security and to manage emerging disease threats with pandemic potential. We will share more news as we have it, but let's give this team of scientists the space to work with their Chinese counterparts effectively, and let's wish them all well and expressing our respect and appreciation to these distinguished scientists and experts. I thank you. Okay, so uh, we're going to move forward to the Pan American Health Organization, or PAHU, hours. where Dr. Etienne is going to address the needs of North and South America. As we know that um, there has been large number of spikes in uh, COVID-19 in California uh, and British Columbia, as well as the um, we're going to hear later on about a lockdown order in Ontario because of the number of cases that are going up there. That, that, that we are not the only ones in North America. There are other countries um, in South America and, and in the Caribbean that are facing um, dangerous spikes, at least to to them. When we consider uh, countries in the in the Caribbean, that um, there are island nations, and that this is a type of of of, of spread of a virus that could uh, overwhelm. A, a whole entire nation's uh, healthcare facilities um, in just a few cases. So we do need to to ensure that these countries are are well protected and that their health care systems are protected, as um, Dr. Etienne is going to address in her next statement right here. Thank you. And a very good morning to all of you, and, and Happy New Year. Um, welcome to the first meeting, um, first media briefing for 2021. And Paho is grateful to you for joining us once again. Since the start of this pandemic, over 39 pe million people across the Americas have become infected by COVID-19. And, and over uh, 925,000 of them have succumbed to the virus. In the last week alone, 2.5 million people were infected with COVID-19 in our region, the highest weekly cases since the virus first reached our shores. Virtually every country in the Americas is seeing an acceleration in the virus's spread. In North America, the United States is reporting the highest new COVID-19 infections and deaths in our region. California and states across the American South have seen dramatic increases in COVID hospitalizations with 13 states reporting record-breaking figures. Today, more than 132,000 are hospitalized from COVID-19 in the United States. These are more hospitalizations than during the pandemic peaks in the spring and the summer. These trends in hospitalizations are also being reported in Canada and Mexico, where the local health systems are struggling to keep up with demanding care. For the South and Central America, 
Data from early January suggests that infections are on the rise in Costa Rica and Belize. However, it's too early to tell the impact of the holiday season on the virus's spread. So we are going to have to remain vigilant over the next few weeks. Across the Caribbean, data from early January reveals that many islands saw rapid rises in infections. The Cayman Islands, Dominica, and the Virgin Islands reported a doubling of cases within the last week alone. And and cases are growing even more rapidly in Barbados, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and Bonaire. And as we move to South America, every country has reported a rise in cases over the last few weeks, even in countries that had seen a decline in cases like Chile and Argentina. As our Southern Hemisphere experiences its summer months, many countries are struggling to limit gatherings and travel, which will most likely fuel infections for weeks and months to come. Scientists throughout the world and our region have also detected new variants of the COVID-19 virus. PAHO's Molecular Surveillance Network spans some 21 laboratories throughout our vast region, and, and we are tracking the spread of the virus and mutations that naturally develop over time. So far, the variant first seen circulating in the United Kingdom has been reported in six countries in the Americas. At this time, there is no evidence to suggest that these variants affect patients differently. But early data does suggest that the virus can spread more easily, accelerating the threat to our health systems at a time in which they are already close to to capacity. And, And that's why the public health measures that we've been urging from the start, such as practicing social distancing, wearing masks in public, and washing hands often remain our very best bet to help control this virus right now in all of its forms. So let's look at the year ahead. Our collective ability to keep up with these measures has the power to determine the trajectory of this year. If we remain diligent, we have the power to control this virus. If we relax, make no mistake, 2021 could well be far worse than 2020. With one vaccine approved for use by the World Health Organization and more underway, we're moving closer to controlling this pandemic. A handful of countries in our region have already begun vaccinating health professionals, and a few have already started protecting other particularly vulnerable populations, like the elderly and those with underlying conditions. However, as long as doses remain limited, we cannot rely on vaccinations to flatten the pandemic curve. As we look ahead to 2021, I would say that there are three priorities that are critical to controlling this pandemic in our region. The first is to ensure equitable access to the tools, both new and old, to prevent and treat COVID-19. We must ensure that health workers have the protective gear and equipment that they need to do their job safely, and that every person who requires hospitalization can access the basic medications they need ISOE beds, if if that is necessary, to manage and treat the conditions. This is especially challenging as cases surge and supply chains are strained. With the arrival of vaccines, we must ensure not just that doses are produced quickly, but they are equitably delivered and swiftly across every country 
regardless of income. This will require global and regional collaboration and solidarity with donors pitching in resources through mechanisms like the COVAX facility. Second, we need leaders to act quickly and foster unity. This pandemic has taught us time and time again that leadership determines the effectiveness of a country's response. As we look to the year ahead, leaders will face difficult choices as we work to flatten the transmission curve. And that's why we need leaders to act transparently so that the public understands their decisions and the scientific evidence that is behind those decisions so we can rally people around a shared plan. We need leaders to act in the interest of public health, not political gain, by working together to make the best use of the tools to prevent this virus. Politicizing vaccines and other control measures is not just unhelpful, but it could fuel the virus and cost lives. And finally, we must balance urgency with good planning. We don't have much time to lose, but we cannot beat the pandemic without strong vaccine delivery plans. And that's why PAHO is working with every country in our region to help secure the vaccine doses that countries need to protect their populations. We're also providing support with vaccine demand planning, logistics and cold chain management, surveillance and information system strengthening, health worker training, and vaccine communicating, communication planning, among others. Luckily, our region has a strong legacy of immunization and the mounting of immunization campaigns. Thanks to vaccination and surveillance efforts, the region of the America was the first in the world to eliminate smallpox, polio, rubella, congenital rubella syndrome, and measles. For 42 years, PAHO's immunization program has helped countries across the Americas work together to protect people against vaccine-preventable diseases. Through our revolving fund, member states pool their national resources to procure vaccines and related products at the lowest price. COVID will be a challenge, but one I believe that we can meet by working together. Okay, so uh, the Canadian federal government is, of course, uh, promising a safe and effective and very swift um, rollout of vaccine and immunization program across Canada, ensuring um, continuous deliveries to all the provinces and territories to ensure that um, those people who are eligible and able to receive the vaccine will actually do so by September. Um, now, remember, this is still January, so we do need to observe patience and calmness so that um, all those who really want the vaccine and need that vaccine, such as our healthcare workers, those who are working in long-term care facilities, and those who are uh, at dangerous ages do actually get that vaccine before um, anyone else. So we need to make sure we stick to the to stick to the protocols um, until the vaccine has been been rolled out. Along with that, we've heard already from the leadership of the Pan American health organization and the world health organization that even though the vaccine is out there the vaccine is becoming more available to people that we still need to maintain all of the measures that we still need to make sure that we are still doing the social distancing washing our hands um, wearing a mask when we're not in ventilated areas that 
um, such as when we go to the store. You go to the store, you wear the mask inside the store because it's not a ventilated area. Most of these stores are keeping their doors closed. So there's no fresh air getting in. And that when we get home, as we are putting the groceries away, make sure that we wash our hands when we get home. And take all care of all the measures uh, to help not spread the virus. And we'll hear more examples of that later later on when we get to the Ontario lockdown also. Um, so let's hear what the um, federal response is as the vaccine is being rolled out and doses of the vaccine are being purchased from Pfizer and Moderna. Good morning, everybody. Bon matin à tout le monde. Uh, nous allons commencer la conférence de presse. Ministre Leblanc. Alors, merci. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Corinne. Bonjour à tout le monde. Good afternoon. Today, uh, I am joined by my colleague, uh, Anita Anand, the Minister of Procurement, and by Dr. Tam and Dr. New in Ottawa. I want to start today by thanking Canadians who are following their local health rules. Please continue to look out for your family, your neighbors, and your community by staying home when you can, by wearing a mask, and by always following the social distancing rules. Our government remains committed to supporting Canadians during the pandemic, and our Team Canada approach is focused always on the health and the safety of Canadians. Depuis le début de la pandémie, notre priorité est la santé et la sécurité des Canadiens. C'est pourquoi nous avons décidé comme gouvernement de rendre le vaccin contre la COVID-19 gratuit pour tous ceux et celles qui voudront se faire vacciner. It is also why we recently announced the new vaccine distribution tracker which is available online on Health Canada's website. Through this tool, Canadians will be able to follow our collective progress in the distribution of vaccines across Canada. And to speak more about vaccine distribution, I'd like to now invite my colleague, Anita Anand, to say a few words, followed by Dr. Tam and Dr. New in Ottawa. Anita? Uh, before I start, I would like to again thank all of our frontline workers who are facing extremely challenging conditions created by the current surge in COVID-19 infections. We know that following public health guidance is key to stemming the infection rate, and combined with the rollout of safe and effective vaccines, we will see our way through to the other side of this pandemic. Le Canada a agi rapidement pour obtenir l'un des portefeuilles de vaccins le plus important et diversifié au monde, en concluant des ententes avec les fabricants lorsque les vaccins potentiels ont commencé à être prometteurs. Grâce à cette stratégie, nous avons pu obtenir le mois dernier la livraison rapide de vaccins approuvés de Moderna et de Pfizer. Pfizer-BioNTech. Our agreement with Pfizer-BioNTech includes a guaranteed minimum of 20 million doses with options to purchase more. As the Prime Minister announced, we have increased our order with Pfizer to add 20 million more doses for a total of 40 million doses to be delivered this year. Canada is well on track to meet our goal of ensuring that we have enough vaccines, that every eligible person who wishes to be will be vaccinated by the end of September. We are focused on delivery, working every single day to get these vaccines into Canada as early as possible as we did last month. For example, as our negotiations with Pfizer led to the advancement of additional deliveries prior to the holidays, we have now confirmed 
an additional 2 million Pfizer doses will be delivered in Q2. These doses were originally scheduled to arrive in the third quarter of this year. They will now be delivered in the second quarter. This is the work of my department and me every single day, that is to accelerate deliveries of vaccines into this country. Vaccines are now in Canada and we are receiving them with greater regularity. However, we should not forget about the extraordinary environment in which we are operating. Vaccine manufacturing is already highly complex and when we factor in unprecedented global demand and complex supply chains, we should not be surprised that the ground is sometimes shifting. I want to be very clear on this point. I have not and will not withhold confirmed information concerning the delivery schedules of vaccines. What I will continue to do is provide concrete facts so that all involved can plan accordingly with as much certainty and confidence as can be provided in the current environment. Once we enter the second and third quarters, Canadians will see a dramatic acceleration in the pace of scheduled vaccine deliveries. This is the largest mass vaccination campaign in our great country's history, and every level of government, every department is doing its part. Public Services and Procurement Canada will ensure that we remain on track to meet our September goal with the delivery of a steady supply of vaccines. Et notre gouvernement continuera d'essayer de faire en sorte que les doses soient livrées encore plus tôt afin de pouvoir vacciner la population canadienne le plus rapidement possible. This is a Team Canada effort. Together, we will see ourselves through to the other side of this pandemic. Merci beaucoup, Meg Wetch. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Tan. Good afternoon and bonjour à toutes et à tous. There have been over 668,000 cases of COVID-19 in Canada including 17,086 deaths and over 82,500 active cases across the country. Nationally, the average case count is now over 8,100 new cases reported daily over the past week, with still increasing number of people experiencing severe illness. There are an average of over 4,500 individuals with COVID-19 being treated in Canadian hospitals almost 850 of whom are in critical care, and 145 deaths are being reported each day. It has been a year and a day since scientists first published the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. We've made substantial progress since that time with better diagnostics, treatments, and a greater understanding of COVID-19 spread and effective prevention measures. Most incredibly, our collective efforts have brought us the development and delivery of our first safe and effective vaccines against COVID-19. All around us, we can hear people saying, the light is at the end of the tunnel, and, but you know, the, the light at the end of the tunnel is here. But though we can see the way more clearly, we are not out of the tunnel yet, and uncertainty and challenges are still ahead of us. COVID-19 activity remains at very high levels in many parts of Canada. Nationally, we are still on an ever-worsening trajectory. The months ahead will be difficult, possibly harder than anything we've experienced to date. This is no easy or fast solution, but we do know that areas of Canada that have adhered to early, strong, and consistent public health measures have been able to slow growth, keep COVID-19 at low levels, or eliminate transmission from an area. The secret to success against this virus is not easy for any of us. It means constant vigilance on the part of everyone and relentless work
together with difficult choices as capacity is stretched across our health workforce. No one should underestimate the difficulties we have faced this past year. I want to acknowledge those, from the many everyday difficulties that have built up over time to the seemingly unbearable challenges, losses, and grief. Every one of us has faced difficulty, whether it has been the loss of a job, strain on family relations or friendships, or the loss of a loved one we could not hold and comfort. To honor all those we have lost, and to care for all those who are suffering, let's remember to always speak and act with compassion. We need this more than ever. Let's recommit to caring and kindness, and we can do this. Together, we will be, it will be easier. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to be hearing from uh, Doug Ford next, uh, the premier in Ontario, and they are seeing uh, uh, cases of the UK variant spiking, and they are also seeing um, cases in um, the original uh, COVID-19 spiking, and their healthcare system is, as he will say, at risk. They are employing a lockdown, but in some of the, some of the cases um, that you're not allowed to 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 um, to go out except for essential goods and items, but they are allowing for. Um, non-essential stores to be able to um, deliver goods at outside pickup points. So um, it's it would seem to be a little bit on the confusing side, and this is the reason why I'm saying said earlier that we as that our leadership needs to make sure that they're putting in place orders that are directed solely at the science and not worrying about um, the economy until later. That people safety first and then we can worry about how we are going to help them pay their rent and uh, other bills later on. So uh, let's hear what Doug Ford actually has to say and remember um, that um, the folks in Ontario they, they they are hitting some dire straits again and they do have the UK variant well good afternoon effective immediately Ontario is declaring a state of emergency we expect this to remain in place for at least 28 days. Further, I'm issuing a stay-at-home order effective Thursday at 12.01 a.m. Under this order, everyone must stay home and only go out for essential trips to pick up groceries or go to medical appointments. Based on the advice from the Chief Medical Officer of Health, schools in Windsor-Essex, Peel, Toronto, York, and Hamilton will remain closed for in-person learning until February the 10th. By January 20th, the Chief Medical Officer of Health will provide recommendations for the remaining regions. As I've said from the beginning, when it comes to our children, I will not take any unnecessary risks. Folks, there will be soon some really dark days ahead, some turbulent waters, but we will get through this. The Ontario spirit has lifted us through worse. The people of Ontario have battled through worse. I know this time will be no different. No more than ever, we need, I need, you to do your part. Stay home, save lives, protect our health care system. The system is on the brink of collapse. It's on the brink of being overwhelmed. We're at levels we've never seen before. Last week I stood here and I told you that our province is in crisis 
and the facts are clear. Cases and deaths are at the highest level since the start of the pandemic and community spread continues to escalate. The dangerous and very dangerous UK strain of COVID is being found across the province. Ontario had eight new cases confirmed today. And if we don't move fast, our hospital ICUs could be overwhelmed by the first week of February. I know everyone is tired. I know everyone is sick of COVID, including myself. I know everyone wants to return to normal. New reports and data show one third of Ontarians are not following public health guidelines. Many are traveling and gathering. And now let me be clear. I'm not blaming anyone. Only one thing is truly at fault, and that's the virus. It just takes a moment. If you let your guard down, it can strike. Think of the teenager out with her friends, not wearing their mask. They go home, pass it to their parents. Later that day at dinner, the virus passes from parents to grandparents. Within days, the grandparent is in the ICU and tragically passes. This is a story we're hearing too many times. Stories like this are why we need to stay home, save lives. My friends, I know the stay at home order is a drastic measure. One, we don't take lightly. Everyone must stay home to save lives. I couldn't be any clearer. Enforcement and inspections will increase. Provincial and local police, bylaw officers, workplace inspectors will enforce these new measures. Under the declaration, they will have powers to disperse people and to issue tickets to bad actors. Bad actors who are caught, they will get fined. And I want to take a moment to address the situation in big box stores. I've seen the crazy lineups. We need more enforcement at these stores. So we'll be starting an inspection blitz of big box stores in the coming days. And I promise you, if we find any issues, there'll be consequences. We'll come down hard on these big box stores if we have to. And this enforcement, it will continue for as long as necessary. But ultimately, from day one, We've been counting on people to do the right thing. The success of these measures will ultimately depend on you. It will depend on each one of you because without all of us rowing in the same direction, this thing could get much worse. Just look at what's happening in countries where the UK variant has taken hold. It's a total disaster. And we've been told by officials it's not a matter of if this new strain takes hold, it's a matter of when it takes hold and how wide it spreads. My friends, this situation is extremely serious. I just can't stress this enough. But unlike back in March, today we have the vaccine. It's on the horizon. We have hope on the horizon. It's in sight, it's within reach but we need to give that vaccine the runway it needs. We need to get through the next few months because the vaccine rollout is tied to supply and based on the current delivery schedule from the federal government, we're still months away from the millions of doses we need to start getting critical mass of people vaccinated. I'm working with the feds. We will do everything we can to help them speed this up. But until then, we're vulnerable. Our hospitals are vulnerable. Our communities are vulnerable. My friends, I know the actions we've announced today are difficult, but they're absolutely necessary. And as your government, we will be there to support people and businesses through these tough times. We have the 24-7 off-peak electricity rate in place. We're providing $200 per child for the parents. We've worked with our federal partners to put in place the new SERB program to help families and workers. The wage subsidy 
and rent relief programs to help businesses get through these tough times. We have the new Ontario Small Business Support Grant, up to $20,000 to help owners with their costs. And we're also suspending the enforcement of residential evictions so people can stay home safely. As everyone stays home, we're doing everything we can to fight this virus. As Minister Elliott will share in a moment, we're ramping up testing in priority sectors of the economy. And we have a robust strategy for tackling COVID in high priority communities. My friends, the people of Ontario, we're strong, we are resilient. I've seen how tough we can be through the first wave and beyond. And as I've said before, tough times don't last, but tough people do. And we have the toughest people in the world right here in Ontario. My friends, stay home, stay safe, save lives. Thank you, and God bless the people of Ontario. Okay, so we're up to uh, British Columbia and what is actually going on here. And um, there have been some spikes and increases in um, the cases of COVID-19. There have also been some um, things pointed out about... um, that is pu- pushing that uh, our healthcare workers are actually helping to spread the um, the virus throughout long term long term care facilities and causing the outbreaks themselves uh, in these facilities. Um, the thing there is, if we don't have our healthcare workers protected. And um, and we're not screening them and everything. That um, who is going to deal with our our loved ones who are actually in these facilities? Who will be t- the ones taking care of them? That yes, we need to make sure that everyone is healthy and everyone is actually being taken care of. Um, We also need to ensure that um, we're using the highest priorities and um, accuracy and precisions in our testing and that we need to make sure that the best information is actually spread to our average citizens so they know what is actually going on. There should be a level of transparency that was brought out uh, by one of our um, earlier segments that we need to ensure all these things are possible and being brought out by our elected officials and ensure that our elected officials are not just acting on politics, that they are acting on the science and the best science available to them. So let's listen to what um, Dr. Bonnie Henry has to say um, on the latest outbreaks and numbers for COVID. And also she's going to make some statements about um, the safe and effectiveness of the vaccine and the vaccine program here in British Columbia. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Uh, So today we're reporting on our weekend numbers. So three reporting periods from January 8th to 9th. We had 538 new cases diagnosed with COVID-19 in British Columbia. From January 9th to 10th, an additional 507 new cases. And in the last 24 hours, 430 new cases. That brings ICU. We have 7,313 Uh, people under active public health monitoring in all of our health authorities, uh, plus some additional in Northern Health. And 50,541 people have now recovered from COVID-19. Sadly, this weekend, we've had 22 more people who have died in our province from COVID-19. And that means now we have over 1,000 people, 1,010 people who have died from COVID-19 in British Columbia. 
These, of course, are our grandparents, our friends, our aunts, our uncles, our sons and daughters. To the families, care providers and communities across British Columbia, we know that this has been a most challenging time. Our thoughts and our prayers are with you all. We do have six new health care outbreaks to report over the last few days at Avalon Gardens, the Gatehouse Group Home, the Guilford Seniors Village, Heart House Long-Term Care on Vancouver Island, Kin Village West Court, and Sun Creek Village. And additionally, four outbreaks have been declared over at the Abbotsford Regional Hospital, and uh, thankfully the, the outbreaks at Bailey House, Chartwell Langley Gardens, and Lakeshore Care Centre have finally um, been declared over, and we know how challenging those outbreaks have been in all three of those long-term care homes where we've had uh, numbers in, of people, our seniors, uh, who have died from the virus in those outbreaks. and It's always challenging. We now have 50 active outbreaks in long-term care or assisted living and 10 in different acute care units involving 1,364 residents right now and 669 staff who have active cases. Today, we've had one new community outbreak declared in Canham Lake First Nation in the Indira Health Region. In addition, the uh, LNG Canada Diversified Transportation Site in Kitimat, uh, that outbreak is now over. Since the start of our immunization program in December, we have now um, delivered 59,902 vaccinations as of yesterday, so it doesn't include today's doses, um, but that's 59,902 of the 71,200 doses that we've had here in the province. Um, that includes 48,533 of the 50,700 doses of the Pfizer vaccine that we received and 11,369 of the 20,500 doses of Moderna vaccine. And we recognize uh, we've uh, put less Moderna vaccine in arms to date, but there's um, uh, really good logistical reasons for that as the Moderna vaccine is what we've been able to deploy to many of the more remote or uh, uh, isolated communities, uh, including some First Nations communities, and uh, the flexibility that we have with the Moderna vaccine makes that possible, but it also makes it challenging because it does take much longer to get out to communities. We do expect to fully use up all of the uh, Pfizer vaccine that we have in the province by today, and we are awaiting our supplies to come in uh, in the coming days. As well, uh, we're awaiting an additional shipment of Moderna vaccine this week. As with we spoke about last week, uh, much thought and consideration has gone into our immunization delivery and approach, and we started slow and steady and made sure we had all of the building blocks in place. The approach is based on our available supply, where the highest risks in our province and who is at risk to be mostly severely impacted by the virus. And this has been the approach that we've been taking, recognizing that we have a limited amount of vaccine that is coming between now and the end of March. Everybody is important in British Columbia, and everyone who is wanting the vaccine and is able to receive the vaccine will have access to it. But we know that some people are at higher risk, and that is why they are getting immunized first. If someone's at higher risks, it means they're either more likely to have severe illness or their circumstances or activities make them more likely to be exposed or to potentially spread the virus. And that is what we're focusing on first. at first. We do not have enough supply coming between now and the end of March to achieve that community immunity that protects us all. So what the approach that we are taking, as with other provinces across the country, are to best protect as many people who are most at risk as possible, to prevent hospitalizations, to prevent deaths, and also those people in our health care system to make sure that we have the resources available to provide safe care to everybody. 
But let me be clear, everybody will have their turn. The focus is on um, these core groups between now and the end of March, but we expect more vaccine and more vaccines to be approved for use come March. And starting in April, we are working on the details of how we are going to sequence once we start having sufficient vaccine that we can immunize more people in our communities across the province. These details will be coming. So if you haven't seen your name on a, on a list for after March, it's because we are working out those it's details hours. both here in British Columbia and across the country. But we will absolutely be looking at our essential workers across the board. We will also be ensuring that we make allowances for people who are at risk by age, by underlying conditions, um, etc. So those details are coming. And we just need everybody, please, to be patient. I also want to address the decision that we have made to start giving second doses at day 35. This is a science-based approach that takes into account the limited vaccine we have early on in the program here in the province. As we know, when someone receives a vaccine, it stimulates our own body's immune system to produce antibodies to that antigen, that protein. And these new vaccines that we have, messenger RNA vaccines, have proven to be very effective at doing that. When you provide the second dose, that's what we call priming the immune system with the first dose. The second dose um, in a two-dose series like this is to provide more durable and longer lasting for a longer period of time immunity. And that's what we call a boost. And we call this a prime boost. And we know a lot about immunization programs and our body's immune system and how they respond. How they respond. By waiting between doses, it allows the body to build up that immunity, to be primed, to develop both the antigens, the antibodies that attack the proteins in the, on the surface of the virus, but also for the body's cell-mediated immunity, our T cells and our B cells, to start to recognize um, the, the antigen or the offending protein, the virus as well. Right now, as I mentioned, we are vaccinating as many high-risk people as possible in this initial period and setting the second dose to just over a month later. So that is the, the process between December and March. And that is because we know that the vaccine that we are receiving, will be receiving, if it comes, as, as we've been guaranteed or we've been told, will be back-end loaded. We are getting more doses in uh, January than we did in December more doses in February than we did in January, and more doses in March, quite a large step up in March compared to um, January and February. So our decision is around maximizing the distribution while balancing the supply and making sure we have a safe and effective immunization program. And we did not take this decision lightly. It was made after reviewing the scientific evidence here in BC, but also nationally and internationally in cons consultation with the immunization experts that we have here in British Columbia. We have a very strong immunization program led by Dr. Monica Nels at the BC CDC with our Vaccine Evaluation Centre and our BC Immunization Committee. As well, um, we have looked at guidance from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization in Canada, which is our number one guidance um, committee to go to around everything to do with immunization programs in Canada and they have had access to all of the data around the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines and they have experts on the National Advisory Committee um, table. I was, have been on it myself in the past and that is where our basic um, expertise and, and recommendations come from in Canada. As well here we reviewed the WHO SAGE committee recommendations and the Immunization Advisory Committee uh, recommendations from both the UK, the US and other countries. What we know based on the data from the clinical trials, both that's been published and that's been provided to the National Advisory Committee on Immunization through Health Canada, the, in, the data that we know from the trials shows that between the first dose with two weeks after the first dose, 
So that gives the body's immune system time to develop the antibodies and the cell immunity that they need. The vaccine effectiveness, so the protection from the vaccine at two weeks after the first dose was 92.6% for the Pfizer vaccine and 92.1% for the Moderna vaccine. That is, quite frankly, amazing from a public health perspective looking at an immunization program. What we're learning is that this short-term protection is achieved rapidly and is very high. So the protection after the second dose in these clinical trials went from 92.6% to 94.8% for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and went from 92.1% to 95.2% for the Moderna vaccine. So what you can see is that the data from the clinical trial shows very clearly that we have early, sustained, high response um, to this vaccine that lasts for at least eight weeks. And I say that because these trial data also show us um, that the people who were in the Pfizer vaccine uh, trial received their second dose from day 19 to 42. And the Moderna trials, they received the second dose day 21 to day 42. And there was no difference between the people who got it at day 19 and the people who got it at day 42 in how well the vaccine worked after the second dose. And there was no decrease in protection between the first dose and the second dose. So these are important things for us to remember. What we know is that it's much more important with a prime boost vaccine series not to give the second dose too soon because your body does not have time to build up that priming in the immune system and it's essentially a wasted dose. But we also know that for many of these uh, two dose programs, uh, the, the boost is actually more longer lasting and stronger if it's given later um, than the, the, the uh, recommended uh, time period. That we don't yet know, but we will be monitoring carefully for that. The WHO and NACI now have extended the interval, the recommended interval for doses to 42 days, recognizing that that was perfectly safe and effective in the, the vaccine trials. And that is, um, we use that information along with our supply to try and get uh, a nice, safe and effective way of providing as much immunization as we can to high-risk groups during a safe and effective period. I will also say that uh, there's been some discussion uh, about a theoretical risk of increased pressure that might allow for a vaccine-resistant strain to, to arise if people don't have the second dose um, in a short period of time. And really this is, in discussions with our immunology colleagues, this is theoretical and really is not expected to arise um, with the very high levels of protection that we're seeing after the first dose or in the particularly short time frame that we're talking about, um, the difference between 28 days and 35 days, for example. And we know that from the doses that we're expected to receive, that we can protect an additional about 150,000 people who are at high risk in our province by starting our second doses at day 35. Given what we know about our immune system, what we know right now about these very effective vaccines and how much vaccine we will receive. And we did an ethical review of this as well, and I will refer people to our ethical framework that's posted on the BCCDC website around our immunization program to make sure that we are being transparent about all of these processes. And we believe this is a reasonable and safe approach in our construct right now of limited supplies at the front end. We will course continue to monitor carefully and we'll be watching what is happening around the world where we are looking at vaccine effectiveness, how long that's, that protection lasts. In the UK when they are extending to 12 weeks, is there an issue in between um, the 6 weeks and 12 weeks for example? We'll be watching all of that very carefully and we'll be monitoring and changing our, our program if needed depending on how much vaccine we have and what we learn about the effectiveness of the booster dose. At this time, we are that much closer to the end of this storm. 
we cannot now abandon all that we have stood for and all that we have done here in BC to hold our line and protect our communities. We will get through this by lending a hand, by giving a wave or a smile even behind your mask to your neighbours, your friends. Kindness, compassion, tolerance and understanding for each other is what we have taken as our mantras to get through this last year. We need to remember that now as we are coming to that end game, as we are going through this period that is the most challenging. We have limited vaccine, and we still have this virus circulating, but we know we can get through this. We know that these are the things that have got us this far and they will get us through this next few months as we get more and more people protected in our community. Using our layers of protection, sticking with our fewer faces, making sure we are unwavering in our focus, no matter how much we want to ease up. These are the things that will get us through these next few months, and then we'll be closer to the spring and closer to the light. And we will make this happen by remembering to be kind, to be calm, and to be safe. Thank you. All right, so that was um, a statement from uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry and Adrian Dex, um, which is going on in British Columbia. And um, since that was recorded, and uh, today we have um, had the numbers for British Columbia and that there are uh, 5,045 active cases in British Columbia, and uh, currently there are 7,238 people who are uh, under active public monitoring uh, to ensure that they um, do not develop symptoms and that... Um, because they ha they have ha seen a recent exposure, so um, we need to ensure that we are doing what we can to ensure that we're not helping spread uh, the 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 virus, and that we do need to ensure that we we wash our hands, we wear a mask in public places, that. Um, we follow um, the 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 uh, the public health orders in our area here in British Columbia. That um, we need to make sure that we aren't inviting uh, having gatherings in our homes, and that we are if we do have to meet with people, that we're meeting with them in well ventilated areas, preferably outdoors. Um, and we need to make sure that we question what our public health officials are doing to ensure that they are acting under science and not just simply acting politically. So thank you for listening to us today. Uh, you've been listening to Policy and Rights. I am Michael and be safe out there and take care. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.